Okay. Thank you all for uh, joining again for another Bible study. And um, last week uh, we had very thin presence, so uh, we could you know, we did not um, uh, continue with the topic. But we have uh, decided that we'll wait for all of you so that uh, we can have more meaningful and uh, more meaningful discussions where we can get more inputs and ideas and thoughts. Uh, so we will continue with the same study we we have started uh, in the previous week and uh, part two of it will be discussing today okay and we are going to play a video uh, which is the continuation of the video which we have uh, uh, studied in the previous week by dr uh, jenny jenny graham it is a, a video uh, from you are included from our website and where she she discusses about the connection between Jesus incarnation uh, and the uh, saving work of Jesus Christ and how it will be implicated to uh, our day-to-day -day lives. She will be discussing about it. The host is uh, Dr. Gary Dedo and it's a, an interview. As I said, uh, we'll be playing that video. But before we do that, uh, may I ask uh, Bertie to lead us in prayer? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, let's bow our heads. Father God, we just want to thank you for bringing us together on this Zoom platform, Lord, uh, for another Bible study. Lord, you want us to grow in grace and knowledge. Lord, we are yours. We belong to you, Lord. You want us to be equipped uh, with the right knowledge, Lord, and, uh, and be equipped, uh, Lord, uh, with the blessings and the help that you give us, Lord, to understand more about you, your Lord, your your worthiness, Lord, your your sovereignty, your goodness to us, and that you are God, Lord. Father, today's uh, Bible study, as we've been told by Pastor Praveen, is, uh, uh, Lord, a continuation of the subject matter um, about about the the saving work of Christ, how how is Christ connected to us, and uh, Lord, how He came in the flesh, in flesh and blood, Lord and how he had, he paid the penalty, complete, full penalty, uh, full due, Lord paid, and uh, has uh, brought in, has abolished death and brought everlasting life, Lord, to the fore. And Lord, we are all blessed to, Lord, receive this uh, wonderful salvation in Christ and uh, to be, be identified and conformed to him. Let's hear, Lord, Father God, we thank you for this uh, dedicated men and women, uh, Lord, who, who love and serve you, Lord, and who, speak the truth so lord we are blessed with the truth of god and the goodness of god so we lord we submit this um this time of bible study lord help us help the speaker help us lord and bless the whole bible study so that you receive the glory father we pray this prayer father in all humility in jesus christ holy and blessed name amen Thank you, Bertie. Uh, we'll uh, straight away, we'll go and watch the video. And then um, after the video, we'll uh, discuss about the topic discussed. The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, Dr. Janine Graham shares some of her teachings and writings on the vital connection between the incarnation and saving work of Jesus Christ through his cross. Our host is Dr. Gary Detto. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad you could be here. Um, I've known you for a while, and I know that you have uh, been teaching theology for quite a number of years now at uh, more than one school. Um, but you know, teaching theology, not a lot of people do that. And uh, in churches I've been in or other situations, sometimes people really wonder, you know, what's theology? Do we really need it? What's, what's it important for? Uh, it seems rather abstract to people. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, you did your doctoral work uh, with James Torrance in Aberdeen in theology, mm -hmm. and you've been uh, teaching for many years. Um, Maybe you could tell us a little bit about why you pursued that uh, that uh, trajectory and what you found a value of uh, in Christian theology. Well, f the first thing that came to mind when you said that was um, being a teacher was never on my radar screen. Uh. 
um, even in elementary school, I thought I could never be a teacher because what if I'd stand before the class and say everything I knew in the first five minutes? What would I I do with the rest of the hour? (laughs) That's never been my problem. It's been the opposite. Too much to jam into an hour. So it's been a bit of a surprise that God has led me there. Uh, Secondly, I went to Scotland again, not to earn a PhD, not to Mm. teach, just I heard him speak at a, a at an extension course, Fuller Extension course, and I was so enthralled. I was mesmerized by what he was saying. And so um, after the second class, I guess, I was walking to my car and I just couldn't get to my car <laughs> mm. because I have this strong compulsion to go back and ask him uh, something. I said, no, 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 time to go. He needs to go. And I just was like, in this uh, this dead in my tracks. And I finally went back and said, Professor Torrance, where would you recommend somebody like me go to study the kind of line of thinking that you're talking about? Because you have brought together the philosophy that I studied in college and the theology in college and seminary, and you've opened up the concept of grace in a way that is so life-giving to me. Mm. I can't not study it. Mm. So where would you recommend? And I had no idea that he would say, come to Aberdeen. (laughs) And I thought, well, I happen to be in between jobs. I happen to have a little money that would enable me to do it. I happen to have an adventurous spirit. So why not? (laughs) So I went there again, not for the degree, Mm -hmm. not for the end goal. Um, That probably would have scared me, the very thought of of teaching or being Mm -hmm. a professor. But I just had to learn and glean from him what I could before he retired the next year. So... Yeah. Now, the next part of your question was... Well, now in the actual uh, teaching, yeah. uh, what's that been like for you? Exciting, although not every aspect of <laughs> teaching is riveting, but it's exciting when you see light bulbs go on in, mm. in students. Um, and especially when I get to share things that are on my heart, that are my passion. Uh, a lot of it I learned from Professor Torrance. And a lot of it is not what a lot of my students have been hearing from the pulpit Mm. or growing up. Um, It's easy for them to fall by default back into thinking of Jesus um, in a certain way and the Christian life in a certain way. And it's kind of ho-hum, yeah, we believe that sort of stuff, but it's not gripping with their heart. Mm. And so I want to share with them the kind of heart-gripping experience that I got from Professor Torrance. And... Um, not everybody gets it because you have to shift paradigms a little bit from, and, and get out of the default mode of the way they've always mm. heard it packaged. Uh, but it's real exciting. Yes, see it happen. right, right. The light bulb coming on, I can identify yeah, with and, that. And theology itself is important. Um, Jesus told us that we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and mm. strength. Our mind matters. And when we are, our mind and our thinking is shaped by distorted thoughts of God that owe more to Greek philosophy than the Bible, for instance, mm. or we import, thing, import things from our culture onto the scripture, mm-hmm. then it kind of has a deadening effect. And that affects how we live life, how we, if we are living a Christian life that's, that's liberating, that's exciting, or just ho-hum, dutiful. Um, so it matters how we think about God and how we understand what God has done for us in Christ. Yes. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes people react. Uh, I mean, I've actually heard pastors say, well, we don't want to get theological Oof. about it. Uh, or others would say is, well, you know, theory has its place and they're thinking theology is theory. And then on the other hand, but, you know, after so much theory, you got to get on to practice and there's kind of a divide there. But uh yeah, I, I think that divides artificial. What, mm-hmm. what would you say? I cringe, <laughs> cringe every time I hear a pastor say, and I've heard a lot of pastors say this because they don't want to turn off the audience. Mm-hmm. And they assume that if you get theological, people are just going to get glazed, look mm-hmm. over their eyes. Yeah. I had an experience once. I was at a church and I was in, I had graduated from with PhD and I was looking for a place to land. So I was doing some teaching for my church at the time was an adult education class and I was teaching on some aspect of the Bible and I happened to let the word theology leave my lips 
But I thought they would get all excited like I do because theology is an exciting thing. And as soon as that word left my lips, I saw that predictable glaze come over their eyes. And, and one person said, we don't want to hear about theology. We just want to know what the Bible says. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I didn't say it, but do you realize every time you're asking questions from the Bible, what does he mean here? How does what Paul says here compare to that? What does it mean in terms of how we understand God? You're doing theology. Mm -hmm. The question is not no theology or, or theology or boring theology. It's bad theology versus good theology. And good theology has very eminently practical um, impact. Yes, well, I could see them kind of thinking that, why you'd be interested and invested in it and spend so many years uh, teaching students. In your years of teaching uh, students, have there been certain very pointed questions where they really wanted to wrestle with? Um, have there been themes that have come up in the classroom, uh, you know, that caught the students' attention? Mm -hmm. Well, there is the predictable one of we all agree if we're Christians that, that um, Jesus died for our sins. Mm -hmm. And okay, Next issue, we've nailed that one. I see. <laughs> Nothing more to be said. Um, and <laughs> I said, oh, there's a lot to be said. Um, that's what sent me to Scotland was to, I realized that Jesus died for our sins, but how does what happened 2,000 years ago actually alter my human nature so that I am transformed? Is it just a theoretical thing? Mm. I say I agree theoretically mm -hmm. to some proposition, or is there something more dynamic going on? Um, when I was in high school, another little anecdote, um, I was a new believer and I went to my first Bible study. They handed out three by five cards and they asked us to write down, what is a Christian? And so I wrote probably 10 seconds flat, I nailed it. Believing that Jesus died for your sin. Okay. And I saw other people take a little more time. My friend uh, that came to the Bible study with me was writing copiously on this side and kept writing and then flipped it over and wrote and filled the other side. And when she told me what she wrote, she was saying, well, it's a moment by moment life relationship and then went on and on. And my thought was, well, that's complicating things. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus died for your sins, you're in. You know, um, I hope my uh, understanding has been <laughs> matured <laughs> since then. But here I get people that were raised in the church, and basically it, that's not too far off from what they understand um, Jesus did. Mm -hmm. And uh, why did he become human? Because you have to have a body to die. So he had to take upon himself a human body so that he mm -hmm. could die on the cross, and it had to be a sinless, spotless lamb so he had to live a, a sinless life in order to be the spotless lamb mm -hmm. that was acceptable. Uh, but it's all aimed at Jesus' death on the cross. Mm -hmm. And what I want to open their eyes up to is, so is that the, the sole significance of Jesus' life? Right. Just having a body that can die and it's the death that we want to emphasize. Yeah. Mm. Is that all? Yeah. Well, I, I know your doctoral thesis, which mm -hmm. turned into a book, mm -hmm. uh, focused on the cross of Christ, um, often called the doctrine of atonement. Cross and resurrection uh, and ascension. <laughs> yes, well, uh, tell us about that, right, because uh, uh, there is a certain focus on the, on the cross mm -hmm. and on the death of Christ but there's uh, more to it. So what kind of things did you explore in your doctoral thesis and in the book that fills that out more? Well, anytime you study with Professor Torrance, you're plunged into reading the early church fathers. <laughs> and so I was introduced to the theology of Athanasius. And um, part of what Athanasius says uh, in his explication of um, of uh, atonement is, well, he, the way he sees uh, the human dilemma is sin is not just breaking the law. In our century, we're so steeped in the legal metaphors, so we think of it as breaking the law, um, so God pays the penalty, or we owe a debt, and so Christ mm -hmm. pays the debt, that kind of terminology. But for Athanasius, sin was more like a corrosion of our deep nature a corrosion of our humanness. We become less human as we dabble in sin, as we traffic in sin. So what's the remedy? 
he rejects the idea of just God simply forgiving us. That doesn't get to the root, the ontological root of our dilemma. We need a, a new heart. We need mm -hmm. a new nature. We need a renovation. We need a recreation of our nature. And so the more I read Athanasius, the more I started seeing, mm, I hadn't thought of atonement as involving that God reaching into the depths of our being to change us there and to transform us. And how does the incarnation um, flesh that out? Mm -hmm. um, so now, more and more, and then reading Bart, you realize atonement doesn't just start with Calvary, it starts with Bethlehem. You know, Jesus takes upon himself our flesh, not just pristine flesh, but the very flesh that we live in, the flesh that's that's fallen, he takes mm -hmm. it. In taking it to himself, he's sanctifying it at the same time, but he takes the very thing that needs fixing so that he can fix our human nature at the ontological depths of our being from within humanity himself. Nobody had ever explained that to me mm -hmm. in college, and mm -hmm. maybe in seminary, but I didn't hear it mm -hmm. uh, in church. Um, and so that started me looking at um, more of the significance of the incarnation uh, for atonement. That's one aspect. Yes, well, that's very important. Uh, a similar thing happened to me in realizing yeah. Yeah. that, uh, yeah, Jesus didn't just come down to kind of say hello and make sure, <laughs> you know, do you see me? You know, here I am. Okay, okay. I'm going to do this thing on the cross. Okay. Uh, and do a few ethical teachings and heal a few people too. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You have to throw that in, although I didn't know where that fit exactly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's it, connecting, right, the incarnation mm -hmm. uh, with the crucifixion. But you also mentioned kind of the resurrection as well. What does is, what is Christ dying on the cross, have to, how does that connect with resurrection? Well, <laughs> Jesus takes our fallen, broken humanity. And, and I, I want to steer clear of the idea of a kind of a penal substitution, Christ pummeling Jesus, punishing Jesus. Um, to let us off the hook. Those ideas are out there, but I, uh, that seems more foreign to me as I read the scriptures and not. Um, you could say that Jesus absorbs the judgment of God. God wants to judge that which is dehumanizing us. Sin dehumanizes mm. us, depersonalizes us. Jesus embraces that in order to get rid of it, to, to divest us of that. So that gets taken to the grave, mm. judged, put away. And then this new creation, this new nature that Jesus has been forging mm -hmm. through living in our flesh, mm -hmm. taking our flesh through every stage of human existence, um, that is raised uh, through his resurrection. That, that is enlivened for us. And we get to um, experience that. The Holy Spirit gets to unite us with him so that we participate. Uh, uh, yeah, we participate in this new life through the Holy Spirit. Uh, if, if it just ended with uh, death, a lot of things would happen. <laughs> uh, take what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, we're still in our sins, we're still mm -hmm. enslaved. Um, uh, our preaching that's mentioning that Jesus rose and is victorious over sin, that's uh, uh, gone. Uh, we're liars. We so said we saw the risen mm -hmm. Christ. So there's all sorts of reasons why um, the resurrection is essential, but also the transformation of our very being is realized through this new humanity, through the resurrection that becomes accessible to us through the union with Christ that's, that the Holy Spirit enables. Yeah, so, yeah, the, the Christ who dies is the Christ who's raised. Yes. Uh, I was taught early on at least what I recall is the resurrection was just to kind of prove that he was the son of God. <laughs> and I didn't really kind of see the connection yeah. between what he accomplished on the cross was completed mm -hmm. in the resurrection. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's not the end of the story either because yeah. the ascension has yes. to come in here too, yes. right? Yes, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Intercede. He ever lives to intercede for us. Hebrews, I think, is at six, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have a representative before the Father pleading our case, uh, representing us on our side, uh, along with the Holy Spirit who who prays for us when we're weak. So we've got the uh, ally of the Holy Spirit and the ally of the risen Christ mm -hmm. with us and present with us through the Spirit in the, to to uh, guide the church and to empower the church.
So Jesus isn't kind of on vacation or, <laughs> or retired. Uh, because I mean, frankly, that's what I kind of used to. I don't. Nobody ever taught me that, you know. But <laughs> that is pretty much what I had been assuming. I didn't really appreciate the significance uh, of the ascended Christ and mm -hmm. continuing ministry. <laughs> so that kind of leaves a, a, a gap. Uh, at least it didn't in, in my thinking in life. Well, even in the Christian life, um, I think somewhere in my teaching I used a football analogy where um, a lot of my students, there are a lot of different atonement metaphors and um, theories. And one of them, one of the more popular ones in this century, I think in the last 20th century and 21st century is Jesus's moral exemplar. Uh -huh. You know, why did Jesus come? to show us how to do it, to show us who God is, to show mm -hmm. us what the problem is. And if we just imitate Jesus, <laughs> um, we too can have that same quality of life. We just imitate, just try hard mm -hmm. to sail over this oh so high bar <laughs> that Jesus that we see Jesus. And so the football analogy is Jesus runs down the field and then he comes back and he hands us the football and he sits on the sidelines and says, oh. okay, your turn. Oh, I right. did my part uh -huh. now. Okay. I'll watch you. Mm -hmm. um, that that doesn't work with atonement. That doesn't work with the resurrection. That doesn't even work with the basic Christian life. Jesus is never on the sidelines. We're never done with our need for the mediator. The whole Christian life is um, Christ in us, the hope of glory. I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. Mm -hmm. In the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus is never taking a snooze, retiring. <laughs> yes, and it's a good thing. The longer I live the, in the Christian life, the more important that <laughs> that becomes, not yes. less important. And it's it's not theory. It's a daily, yeah. Yeah. daily thing. And even in our prayers, in our worship, uh, and all that to uh, recall, yeah, Jesus is not kind of off the scene, you know, off somewhere, somewhere else uh, is, yeah, a great joy. Uh, in privilege. Is there anything else you, you'd like to say ab about kind of uh, kind of what you learned about the uh, uh, the atonement um, and all that that sometimes gets missed? Uh, well, uh, my book in, embedded in the title um, is representation and substitution, and that was that became the focal point of my doctoral dissertation, suggested to me by Professor Torrance. Although my readings in the theology of Barth and all had been leading me in those directions. Substitution would come up, representation. So I'm trying to figure out how do those work and how does that work together to make me right with God, um, to uh, for God to reconcile the world to mm -hmm. Himself. And so um, that became my focus. Jesus is our substitute. And today, as I think I might have mentioned, substitution oftentimes gets strewed, construed as penal substitution, God punishing Jesus who stands in our stead. Jesus, God is angry with us. God would normally punish us because we're the sinners, we're the perps. But Jesus says, okay, if, you, I'll, if we let them off, if I stand in their place. And so, okay, the vengeful God uh, takes it out on Jesus uh, and we are the beneficiaries. Uh, that's one way of understanding substitution. That's not the only way. Jesus does something for us that we can't do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the one who well, this gets into the double movement of Christ. Jesus is the one who does something for us we can't do for ourselves. We can't. Jesus says the the sum of the law is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I don't know about you, but I never do that perfectly hmm. every day. Yeah. Love God with everything you've got. Mm -hmm. I'm always loving myself in bad ways and, <laughs> and not loving my neighbor as I should and, and falling short of God. Um, Jesus does that because this is the concept that I learned from Torrance. Um, I've never heard it before, but it was, he talks about the double movement of grace. Double movement of grace? How come no seminary professor introduced that? And he said, it all goes back to the all important who question. Um, professor Torrance says, you can't understand the what of what Jesus did on the cross before you've answered the who question. If your answer, uh, if your answer to the who, if you think, well, Jesus died on the cross to, to take our sins away, uh, you've already presupposed your answer to the who question. Well, he was either, he was just a man. 
But then how does that really do the job? He was just a man who inspired me to be self-sacrificial and benevolent towards people. That doesn't change my heart. If he's just God, that thing which he did on the cross doesn't really reach me. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, he's not in solidarity with me. It's sort of coming from somewhere above. And how do I relate to that? How does that fix me? Um, The answer I hear from the (coughs) classic creeds and the scripture is Jesus is fully God. Uh, in him all the fullness of deity dwelt in bodily form, mm-hmm. Colossians 1.19, yeah. 2.9. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, mysteriously, this wondrous um, um, reality, he is also fully human. Not partially, not half and half, not 80-20, mm-hmm. 70-30, mm-hmm. 100 and 100% both in the same person. And so, um, Torrent says, when we look at what Jesus did in his life, we have to kind of break that or, or uh, realize that he's acting as God and he's also acting as human being. The covenant says, God, when God established the covenant with Israel, I will be your God, you'll be my people. That shorthand gets laced throughout scripture. God is faithful to be their faithful uh, uh, provider, um, covenant partner, and Israel is not all that good at being faithful mm-hmm. back as the faithful mm-hmm. covenant partner. So. Eventually, God says, I'm going to give in Jeremiah, I'm going to make a, co- a new covenant. Uh, not because the bad covenant, the, uh, the, the previous iterations of the covenant are bad, but because people's hearts are broken mm. and they can't do it. So I'm going to change their hearts. I'm going to change their minds. And so that promise is set out there and Jesus comes along as the true Israelite, the one who is going to do the job on both sides of that relationship. He is fully God, so he can represent the things of God to us. We know who God is, we don't have to guess, we don't have to fill in the blanks for ourselves. Well, I like to think of God as this way. No, when you see Jesus, you see the heart of the Father. Um, He shows us the Father, he forgives sins, he does the, the prerogatives of the Father. At the same time, he is in our position as in solidarity with us as the faithful covenant human partner, Mm -hmm. being faithful, living a life of utter faithfulness, of of loving and trusting and unbroken communion with the Father. He's doing both things at the same time. He's fulfilling the covenant from both sides. I had never heard that Mm -hmm. before. It made so much sense. And it's almost like I, I, the picture I get is looking at Jesus through binoculars. And sometimes when I look at through the binoculars, I close one eye or the other and Torrance teaching is saying, no, look through both Mm. lenses. Look at him as truly human and truly God at the same time. He's doing this. And that is at the heart of his representation. He represents God to us. He represents us to God. Um, And uh, yeah, and so he is rendering our faithful response to the Father on our hand, on, on our behalf and in our place. And that's the difficult part for my students. They get the fact that he's God with us. Mm-hmm. Here's, we're moving into Christmas. Uh, you shall call his name Emmanuel God with us. They get mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. He got, and they get that Jesus was a man, that, but they think of him, he showed us how to live ethically and all. But they don't get Jesus as the faithful human covenant partner of God who, who offers the perfect response to the Father that we fail to offer on our behalf. Well, thanks for sharing with us. Uh, That really gives us a picture as to why you've invested Mm -hmm. so much of your life in uh, studying scripture and the theological synthesis of all that, and why you want others to know Mm -hmm. and appreciate and enter in and uh, do that through your teaching. Thanks so much. Welcome. You've been watching You're Included. a production of Grace Communion International. So, well, uh, I guess uh, it was quite a deep theological subject has been discussed. Um, So, from the interview, do you have any thoughts to share or any questions you have so that we can uh, discuss about it? Anybody have any thoughts to share?
Yes, Bharti. It was very enlightening, uh, uh, the interview, and it was uh, very, uh, very, uh, uh, it's to the fact, to the truth, it is uh, that she mentioned about uh, Jesus Christ being fully God and fully human. But the most important thing uh, she mentioned, Jesus Christ represented man, okay, as the faithful covenant partner. It did what man, Adam, he did what Adam was supposed to do. Was supposed to be, we're supposed to be he made us, he created an image and likeness of God. He, he equipped us with everything, but that lie made us go astray or the deception, whatever. But in Christ, he fully represented us as a human. He was fully God, yes. And uh, the triune God was in him. And also he was fully uh, human in the sense that he represented man perfectly. Uh, and as a perfectly in the sense as a faithful covenant partner, Adam was supposed to be that towards God, and he failed, and therefore his heart was broken. As he said, uh, he you know he changed the heart, he changed the mind. You know that's why uh, it says that the repentance, the change of mind, it is a returning and turning, and Christ made it, God made it possible in Christ for us to return because, and we live in Christ. We live in Christ. We live live in Christ, and He is our source of life. He is our life, and He is our source of life. Where the new covenant is concerned, where the new human is concerned, you know, uh, whereby we are we are healed, we are totally changed. Okay, that old self, corrupted by sinful, deceitful desires, has been crucified. Christ did that for us. He took our sins and put it. And you know, died on the cross, and he can offer us forgiveness, but that is buried. That is, buried. and the new self is been created after God in true righteousness and holiness. So that's the Christian life that we have been called to live. And we, uh, even that uh, the the lady mentioned, you know, how can we, how can we have that standards with Christ had, and how can we uh, attain it? But the but the solution is, or but the uh, the cue is that that we have to we have put on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, through repentance and baptism and receiving the faith, uh, receiving the faith of Christ. So we have we are called we are called to be faithful covenant partners with God. Always intended man to be with God, and Christ did it. Christ did it for us as a representation, substitution. Yeah, but as representing us. And when we are in Christ, we have the help. As she mentioned, the help of the Holy Spirit, help of uh, Christ, and uh, and all that the teachings, uh, our Christian teachings, teaches us you know, in the way of life. So it's uh, Christ with us all the way. Absolutely, so, yeah, all the way. Is it uh, really in a beautiful manner? Um, and the key to that is the who question, which we are continuously talking about. Jesus could be the perfect uh, and faithful covenant partner because. Yeah. He is hundred percent God and he is hundred percent man. He is he is the only person in the entire uh, uh, creation or in entire world universe uh, who is suitable to to be the perfect faithful partner, covenant partner between God uh, and man. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Any other thoughts? Okay. okay, let me, Sachin, do you have any thought? Okay, uh, let me, uh, as you're thinking, let me bring before you a few, few points, few important uh, thoughts, which I noticed uh, throughout the, from the interview. And uh, starting from, uh, number one is theology. Theology got a bad rap all around the world. And many people think theology is for some pastors or seminarians. Uh, it's not for all, and it has a, people think bad about it. But the reality is, everybody who thinks about God, everybody what uh, whatever they believe about God is their theology. Even atheist has his own theology. When he when we talk about God, he has his own description of God. 
And that it, that is his theology. So there is no human in this world who does not have a theology. And the question is not about whether we should uphold theology or not. The question is always about upholding or pursuing the right theology. So as Christians, we should not be, uh, we should not, we should not hesitate to do theology as we are studying the scripture and all what we are thinking, as we are thinking about God, what we are doing is nothing but theology. That's an empowering, very good point uh, she brought to us. And another point uh, we can notice is how Jesus' incarnation changes our life. And what does it mean? Uh, it, it teaches us, well, you know, um, uh, how the incarnation of Jesus changes our lives is very much important to we Christians, uh, not just Christians, for everyone, uh, for the matter of fact. Uh, may, many a times we think uh, being becoming a Christian means just believing in Jesus. He died for my sins. Uh, so if we do that, then you are, be, you are a Christian. But in reality, that is just the beginning. Uh, in fact, we talk about salvation, the word uh, we, we use very much. Are you saved or have you received your salvation? This is the language we regularly use. And Romans uh, chapter 5 uh, gives some interesting points here. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 to 11, if you read, 8 to 8, 9 and 10, they say that we are, while we are still sinners, Christ died. God demonstrated his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And then it says in uh, chapter 11, uh, sorry, verse 11, while we are sinners, if we are saved by his death, we shall be saved much more by his resurrection, uh, sorry, by his life. We shall be saved much more by his life. So Christian life is, uh, Christian life or salvation we are talking about, it is completely related to the life of Jesus. It is completely related to the resurrected life of Jesus and how he works in us. As Apostle Paul says that uh, I, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. You know, uh, and now the life I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. When he says the li life of Christ or the Christ who is living in me, it is not kicking us away from the screen again. The next Apostle Paul immediately, he says that we live the life by the faith of the Son of God. So it is Christ who is living in us and we live by the faith of the Son of God. So it is 100% participation uh, with Christ's work as well as our participation. Uh, it is uh, an ongoing relationship uh, that uh, our salvation is talking about. Christian life is about ongoing relationship with this resurrected uh, Jesus Christ. That's an important uh, thing we have to uh, think about. Even I would like to ask you uh, to uh, think about this question after even, uh, even after the Bible study. What does it mean to become a Christian or how does the incarnation of Jesus is uh, influencing me? How is it uh, uh, working in my life? I guess that is very important thing. All of us, we should be contemplating and we should be exploring and we should be pursuing. And uh, another important point we can find uh, uh, in the discussion was about atonement. She says, uh, atonement did not start uh, from Calvary, but atonement started from Bethlehem. So as Christians, we think many a times atonement, well, Jesus died for my sins. At the moment we talk about it, we, we think about cross, Jesus died, and uh, that is the starting point and all. But in reality, atonement started uh, with uh, Bethlehem, which means the moment Jesus was born as a human, the atonement has started and in fact accomplished. Jesus becoming a human itself is the act of atonement. And various part, things are part of uh, uh, part of that. If Jesus' uh, atonement is only about Jesus dying on the cross, there is no point in Jesus resurrecting from the dead. And even if you think resurrection only is, uh, we, we require resurrection for our forgiveness and it has been accomplished by his resurrection. If it is only that much, there is no point in Jesus ascending and remaining as a human in the heavenly places. So the birth of Jesus, death of Jesus, resurrection of Jesus, ascension of Jesus, and Jesus being seated in heavenly places, all throughout eternity, all these things is atonement actually. Jesus becoming... I mean, man, God, man, uh, I'm not talking about sadhu kind of things, but God, man, 100% God and 100% man, that itself 
is atonement and cross is a part of it that we need to uh, understand so uh, the, that's another important point uh, uh, she brought to our attention and another thing she said about uh, said was about jesus as our substitution we always think gee i was supposed to receive punishment jesus on my behalf he received punishment it is not just substitute taking just um, dying for us it is like you know jesus did not just die for us but jesus died as us that's why apostle paul could say when jesus died i was dead when jesus was crucified i was crucified uh, when jesus rose again from the dead i rose again from the dead we can see that uh, analogy in romans chapter 6 and even in galatians so uh, jesus atonement or jesus substitution is not just for us but it is as us so which takes us to the next point the connected point that is if jesus died as us jesus lived as us and jesus lives as us okay so if you talk about humanity where can we see the true humanity the true humanity cannot be seen in you and my me but the true humanity can be seen in jesus only and and even then where can we see the true humanity is it jesus performing miracle while jesus performing miracles or is it jesus while jesus was a helpless baby boy or is it in jesus being a helpless person and died on the cross or being buried uh, in the grave or in resurrection where can we see the true humanity actually the true humanity can be seen in the in jesus who is ascended and seated in heavenly places there we can see the true humanity uh, our identity your identity my identity is being seated in the heavenly places in jesus that's why apostle paul says our life it has been hidden in christ and we are seated in the heavenly places so our hum- true humanity can be seen in the ascended jesus so because jesus did not just die for us he died as us he lived as us and he is living as us that's why we all are being seated in the heavenly places so another point which uh, bertie already started jesus is being the faithful covenant partner it's all it all can be accomplished because of the only one question who jesus is he is 100% god and 100% man these are some of the thoughts i noticed uh, uh, from the uh, interview uh if you if you have anything that has uh, that strike now also please feel free to share any questions or uh, comments yes but after that uh, uh, share yeah uh, b- uh besides being uh, the atoning sacrifice on our behalf or with us god is also called jesus is also called the uh, life giving spirit now we uh, we are what we are uh, means uh, conforming to christ and uh, he is still living in us uh, as a life giving spirit and so we should never forget that that he is with us uh, in toto another thing is this thing in scripture says that uh, uh, being reconciled by faith we are at peace with him through jesus christ by whom we have access by faith into the into this grace in which we stand and uh, have the hope and and uh, rejoice in the hope of uh, the eternal uh, in the glory of god uh, so uh, my point is even grace grace also is uh, you know grace is part of the gift of god to us grace by you know by god is looking at us with grace with faith with grace you know uh, is very much needed for us and uh, we should always in our prayer say lord your in the the bible says grace my grace is sufficient for you he told in the scriptures you know to paul and in other respects you know so uh, even that passage i can't put uh, the exact one but it says the grace of god which brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness or saying no to ungodliness and worldly passion worldly lust we should live sober righteous and godly lives in this present age while we await the blessed hope and glorious appearing of a great god and savior it mentions the of the great god and savior jesus christ mm-hmm. who will uh, you know yeah who will come to restore the kingdom of god earth wide 
and will God, you know, he will be sitting on his throne, you know, and we also have been promised to be kings and priests. Uh, and he is the faithful God, you know, faithful covenant uh, partner. And uh, he will come in his glory. And we, the Bible says, we also will receive the glory, uh, you know, of that Jesus Christ will share with us. So uh, my point is grace. Remember the, along with the faith of Christ, it is the grace also God says. He brings us into the grace in which we stand. We are able to, we are, you know, in whatever circumstances, whatever we are. Uh, God's grace sustains us, you know. It's an ongoing thing, as uh, uh, Pastor Praveen says, it's a relationship, and it's an ongoing relationship. Yeah. What he has started, he will complete uh, 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 unto the day of Jesus Christ, the scripture says. Yeah, uh, absolutely, buddy. Uh, thanks for the thought. Uh, and Sachin, uh, would you like to share? Um, well, the... When the lady was sharing, I just remember um, Dr. Andrew uh, Root's uh, uh, connection. You know, uh, Jesus being 100% human and 100% uh, God brings a very important this thing of relationship. We cannot say we the, this God is sitting somewhere in heaven, does not know what it means to be a human does not know what it means if when we get hurt, when we get sad, when we get happy, when we are helpless, you know. We cannot say this God. Jesus being human, he lived with us, being like us, living very much this thing. And when so that means we know that he knows what we can go through. And through him, so by him being a human, through him, we got an access to God. And we part as he participate in our life, we get to participate in the, the life of the triune God. Because as, as, as Pastor Praveen has said, I, as Apostle Paul, he quoted, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. How does that happen? Where two or three are gathered, there I am in the midst of it. So when we are connected, like here we were sitting, when we are connected, our spirits are connected and there we have a Holy Spirit. We are getting together. So that's how we are We are connected with God and God is connected us in our humanly this thing. So it's a very important fact is relational. And, and that relation is not something different, but it is an ongoing communion relation. I mean, the way we are interconnected with our spouses more than that, how it is between us, human, and God. So it's not something to be kept differently. That okay, this God understand what I'm going through it, and 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 it's is is uh, you know being my high priest now. He he is there with us every time, and that's an assurance. That's a wonderful thing. So that's why they say relationship is incarnation. In a, very much your and my relationship, where our spirits are joined, there God is in between, right there. And that is how they are participating in our life, and we get a chance to participate in the life of Triune God. That's 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 the power of a relational, and that's how our God is relational. He understands, and that gives us hope. That gives us, and that His grace helps us. That's something I want. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, any more thoughts? Pastor Dan, you like to share something? Uh, I guess we might have got the glimpse of what uh, we have discussed by the discuss. I mean, the uh, comments you heard probably. I have. Hi, everybody. Uh, I didn't uh, see the video, so I was not. I'm not fully aware exactly what was discussed, but some of those uh, points that all of you made were certainly very interesting. And uh, just to pick up on what uh, Sachin said, uh, which is uh, new, I mean to say, I've heard it for the first time. Relationships are fundamentally incarnational. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not quoting you correctly, but, uh, but that's a very interesting thought. Relationships um, are incarnational. 
And um, uh, I think Praveen, you mentioned uh, about Christ dying, not uh, in our place, but as mm -hmm. us. And this is something maybe we should discuss uh, uh, sometime down the line. This whole concept or question about the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And there are various uh, you know, theories about that. And uh, there is one in particular, which some Christians hold very dear, and that is the penal substitution, which tends to once again give a picture that is not uh, fully uh, correct. So maybe we can discuss that. That, that just came to my mind. But uh, pleasure to see you all. I'm sorry I uh, have been uh, occupied a bit because of my daughter. And, uh, but good to see you all. How is uh, Dr. Leanne, Pastor, any update? I uh, just wanted to say that she's uh, improving, but uh, it has been a bit slow than, slower than we expected, but uh, we are hoping that uh, in time she will, you know, get back the full use of her left arm and uh, the, you know, uh, the neck being uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor, for your uh, uh, thoughts. Definitely, we'll uh, discuss about these uh, substitution, um, various substitute, various atonement theories. Sorry, uh, even uh, if you read Book of Hebrews, we find atonement is seen not just as substitution and some in some other uh, ways also. The atonement has been ex explained as redemption, has been explained about as a covenant. Uh, sorry, test testament. Uh, it was uh, explained uh, as uh, uh, some kind of, uh, what we we'll call it, uh, um, purification, sanctification uh, terms, and it has been explained uh, uh, in some like relational terms, things that are related to conscious and becoming more of ourselves. In various terms, the atonement has been explained in book of Hebrews. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, when we get time, we'll uh, discuss more about those uh, different thoughts about uh, atonement. Yes, Bertie. It's interesting in the video that lady mentioned that uh, sin has uh, actually uh, dehumanized us. Yes, uh, yes. Made us, yeah, made us uh, sort of, we have lost, uh, you know, the potential, uh, lost, you know, what, uh, what we are supposed to be as humans, as God made us. Okay. And that Christ, and that Christ, uh, you know, uh, fulfill that, uh, you know, as us, and uh, it's, uh, thanks to God, you know, he receives the glory uh, in Christ Jesus, you know, he helps us to be, you know, the human beings that God says uh, that we should be. Yeah. So, as, a, as a Pastor uh, Sachin says, all we, uh, it's all along, it's all the way, you know, uh, it's, uh, it is Christ in us. Christ in us is, in fact, this is, this is the Bible. Christ in us is the hope of glory, and uh, you know, uh, the Bible also says that we that we rejoice in the hope uh, of the glory of God. You know, uh, through through the you know through the faith of Christ, through also the hope, as Pastor Sachin said, it's a show hope. It's a it's a joyful hope. That's why God says, never forget that. You know, and uh, it helps us in our Christian living. And that uh, eyes should be on the Lord <laughs> in in everything in a suff in a suffering uh, in a gladness in uh, in all our living, you know that way. Absolutely, yeah, that was quite interesting thought. Uh, uh, sin dehumanizing us, in uh, sin depersonalizing us again. Deeper. He's talking again that he's bringing focus onto the relational aspect of uh, uh, human life. Um, I, with this perspective, I feel it's quite interesting. It would be quite interesting to study Genesis chapter two and three. Uh, so that may bring lead us towards entirely a revolutionary uh, perspective and understanding, which we can do sometime later. Uh, and we cross the time; it is seven now. And um, if you don't, uh, if you don't have any thoughts, we will uh, close with a word of prayer. Okay. If anybody have any thoughts on last, we can go. Otherwise, we'll close with a word of prayer. Mm 
Okay, so we consider the silence as uh, no. And uh, can I request uh, uh, Mr. Anil uh, to close uh, close our Bible study with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God in heaven, <clears throat> we are so very grateful for the opportunity you give us to come together and discuss your word, glorify you, glorify your son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Lord, continue to guide us, continue to fill our minds with your truth, Lord. Continue to give us more and more spiritual understanding and insight, Lord. Your word is lost. As somebody said, your word is not just a book, it's a library. So God, help us to really go deep into it. And without you, we can't do it. And we are very grateful for Father Pastors, Praveen, Sachin, and Mrs. Zachariah in expounding your word. Continue to inspire them, Lord. And we continue to pray for all our brethren. That may you look over us. And in everything we do, we give you the glory, God. So, God, thank you so much. Dismiss us now as we go. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank, you, sir. And thank you all for joining us. Have a good uh, rest.